Uh, okay, uh, so thank you again, uh, everyone who's joined. Uh, and uh, I thought uh, in this lecture, uh, you know, we could uh, conclude our discussion of Hawking's original paradox. Uh, and so before I do that, uh, I just wanted to remind you uh, of the original discussion that we had of the, the perspective that Hawking first put forward, which led to this argument that black holes would lose information. And uh, there were two parts of uh, Hawking's argument. Uh, and uh, the two parts of Hawking's argument um, were the following, okay? uh, which uh, we tried to emphasize uh, while we were reading the paper. Uh, so on the one hand, there was a concrete computation. Right? Uh, and the concrete computation, uh, I mean, what Hawking did was uh, slightly different. Hawking computed the flux at scry plus, uh, but uh, you know what we did uh, was uh, equivalent to that, but what we computed the two point function uh, of these modes that we call small a, and we found that this two point function uh, was of this form, uh, which didn't depend on uh, what the initial state of the black hole was. Uh, it didn't depend on these other, these so-called B modes, uh, you know, which control what the data at the horizon was. And this looked like it was just some universal prediction uh, for the two point function. And uh, this concrete computation uh, led Hawking to argue uh, that the final state uh, should be a thermal state, because as you see, uh, this is the occupancy of a simple harmonic oscillator uh, in a thermal state. And so this was the computational part of this. Apart from this two-point function, Hawking gave an example of uh, a four-point function as well, and then had an argument uh, also for how cross correlators would vanish and pointed out that within this approximation, if we were to compute also you know, an eight-point or a 10-point correlation function, we would always find answers uh, that are consistent uh, with the final state uh, being a thermal state. And so this was the computational part of Hawking's work. Uh, but of course, uh, even at that time, it was realized, I mean, uh, even while we were discussing this derivation, uh, people had questions about, you know, the fact that we had ignored uh, the effect of back reaction. You know, we had done this uh, computation in a quasi-static approximation, uh, which is an approximation where we were computing the occupancy of these modes, but neglecting the fact that uh, because the modes uh, were leading to leakage of radiation, uh, there was actually uh, the, the geometry itself was changing over long time scales. And so there were all these questions that people uh, could have had and, you know, were obvious questions to ask. And therefore, Hawking also had some intuition uh, that suggested uh, that it should really be the case that the final state uh, should not have information about part of the initial state, uh, which control, you know, should not have information about what fell into the horizon. And that intuition uh, came uh, by looking at the causal structure uh, of uh, the extended black hole geometry. And so that, you know, uh, one way uh, to articulate that intuition uh, is to think about uh, the extended Penrose diagram. Uh, and in this extended Penrose diagram, uh, if you draw the horizon, uh, you see that we have an extended version of scry plus here. And it seems that, you know, if you were to draw like some Cauchy slice here, uh, what happens here on the Cauchy slice, uh, the place where I've drawn some crosses, uh, is not visible uh, to the observer at Scry Plus. So if you have an observer here, uh, this observer is out of causal contact uh, with the inside of the black hole and therefore uh, cannot see uh, what fell into the black hole. And this uh, suggests that even if the final state is not exactly a thermal state, even if there are corrections uh, to the thermality of the state, uh, Hawking uh, used this fact, the fact that the causal structure was different uh, to argue that, you know, even if it's different, you clearly don't have information about what's happening inside. And uh, this is what, uh, you know, went by the name of the principle of ignorance, uh, which is the phrase that Hawking used uh, to argue that this uh, little observer uh, that we have drawn on Scry Plus will have to adopt a principle of ignorance about the part of the Cauchy slice that's inside the black hole. And this principle of ignorance will is what leads the observer uh, to conclude that the state, the final state on Scry Plus uh, is a mixed state. Okay? Uh, so last time uh, we argued uh, based just on uh, concrete statistical mechanics, we tried to address uh, this argument, okay, the first, uh, the computational part of the argument. Uh, and let me just uh, remind you uh, what the the uh, the argument was. Uh, the argument was that uh, you know if you look at a typical pure state, so if psi is a typical state uh, in in a large Hilbert space, 
and I'm, at this point, I'm phrasing the result imprecisely, although last time I gave you a more precise result. Uh, the claim was that if you look at some observable, let's call it A, uh, and you look at the difference between this observable, so typical state in a large Hilbert space, uh, and let's say this is drawn from a given energy, from a given energy band, Then the argument we made last time was that if you were to look at the microcanonical ensemble, uh, this tracy is over the same energy band uh, and compare the expectation value in the typical state uh, to this microcanonical ensemble, you find that this deviation is of order e to the minus s by two. Okay? I emphasize that uh, this uh, result that I have on the blackboard right now is just an, uh, is, not, is not a completely precise result. Uh, we had a more precise result uh, last time. Uh, and it could be that there are some states which are atypical uh, and for those states, you know, the deviation uh, from the microcanonical state is larger than e to the minus s by two. Uh, but the point is that if you have such atypical states, uh, they take up a very small volume in the entire Hilbert space. And therefore, you know, for most states, uh, the expectation values of observables are the same as that of a mixed state. And therefore, uh, the conclusion of this part of the argument is that Hawking's computation of uh, these correlation functions, these two point or four point, or you know, any finite number of point correlation functions that we can do, is very far from sufficient uh, to conclude that the final state is mixed. As you see on this equation, uh, clearly this is a pure state and this is a mixed state. And yet these two uh, can differ by extremely small amounts, by amounts that are suppressed exponentially in the entropy. In the case of black holes, the relevant entropy or the relevant dimension of the Hilbert space uh, is uh, the entropy of the black hole, uh, because that's what we believe the microstates of the black hole are. And so we expect that, you know, it is not surprising uh, that the final answers that you get are close to thermal answers. In fact, it would have been surprising if the final answers had not been thermal. Uh, perhaps one point uh, that I should have emphasized last time uh, was that in the black hole geometry, uh, there is a natural perturbative parameter and the natural perturbative parameter, in fact, in, in a theory of gravity, it, you know, the, the coupling constant is G Newton, but G Newton is a dimension full parameter. So, you know, G Newton itself can be a, 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 a perturbative parameter. Uh, you have to multiply it with the right uh, energy scales and the energy scale in an evaporating black hole background is the temperature of the black hole itself. Uh, because you see, it's the temperature of the black hole that controls uh, you know, the, the energy of the quanta. And therefore, if you start asking what is the effect of gravitational interactions is given by G Newton times the temperature, but this is not dimensionally correct. Uh, you have to raise this to the power D minus one. Uh, and now you get, and that's just by counting dimensions, the dimensions of G Newton in, in D plus one dimensions. Remember that the space time always has D plus one dimensions. And if you just do dimension counting, you will see that the natural perturbative parameter is G Newton times t to the d minus one. But if you remember, uh, remember that t was one over rh, where rh was the horizon scale. And if you, therefore, what we have here is one over rh uh, to the d minus one. Uh, but remember that up to some constants, that is also the entropy of the black hole. Therefore, this natural perturbative parameter is also one over s. So the natural parameter in which one would do perturbation theory in the black hole background, uh, if you had to go beyond uh, you know, the leading order effects and if you had to go beyond quantum field theory and curved space time, and if you had to incorporate the effects of gravity is indeed one over S where S is the entropy of the black hole. And if you compare E to the minus S by two and one over S, uh, you see that you know, if you wanted to control effects of size E to the minus S by two, you would have to go, you know, not only to first order and gravity perturbation theory, but you would have to control non-perturbative gravitational effects as well. And uh, therefore, you know, as, as I tried to emphasize uh, last time, uh, you know, even the first order correction, even the one over S corrections uh, to Hawking's computation uh, have not been worked out uh, carefully. And uh, no one has worked out, you know, the final state of black hole evaporation uh, fully non-perturbatively. And if one wanted to, you know, extend Hawking's argument uh, to get a true paradox, uh, then one would have to, uh, you know, do uh, this non-perturbative computation. And that's the only way uh, one could arrive at a paradox. 
and no one has done that. And therefore, the concrete computation that Hawking presented was not sufficient uh, to lead to a paradox. Uh, so that's uh, a summary of what we said last time. Uh, but uh, someone could ask, well, you know, fine, you know, uh, the computation is not sufficient uh, to lead to a paradox. Uh, but that was not the only argument. You know, what you uh, someone could say, you know, what you're telling me right now is that you know the the uh, state that Hawking computed, the thermal state, receives corrections. And so fine, we know that it receives corrections. Uh, but you know, look at the causal structure of the black hole, and you clearly see that the information that falls into the black hole is lost. How is uh, oh? There's a question. I see. Uh, S is a S is a continuously changing parameter, right? And how is it a natural perturbative parameter? Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. Uh, S is something which is changing. Uh, so at a given time, so once again, when I say it's a natural perturbative parameter, you're right. I'm thinking in the quasi-static approximation. Uh, if you were to compute at a given time, uh, you know the the uh, you have some Hawking radiation that has been emitted at a given temperature, and you were to compute, uh, you know what. Um, uh, you know, gravitational effects do and what kinds of correlations they introduce. Uh, you should use the S at that point. You should actually use the temperature of the, the energy of the Hawking quanta. And that is that corresponds to the temperature at which the Hawking quanta were emitted. And that's what you should use. But you're, you're right that, you know, if you go to very long time scales, S itself changes. And therefore, you know, the coupling constant itself, in a sense, uh, is changing as a function of time. And so if you really wanted to compute the final state, you'd have to be careful about that as well. Uh, does non-perturbative mean no perturbation? Uh, no, no, sorry. Non-perturbative is, is just the opposite. It means that, that you have to go uh, to all orders in perturbation theory and, and beyond. You know, if you do perturbation theory, perturbation theory is an asymptotic expansion. And so perturbation theory at some point ceases to converge. And uh, non-perturbative means you have to go beyond perturbation theory. You have to control, you know, you have to do some exact uh, computation using the path integral or using some other techniques. Uh, that is not an expansion in 1 over s. Uh, but that is able to include e to the minus s corrections as well. Uh, to say this another way, uh, in quantum electrodynamics, you know, the fine structure constant is a perturbative parameter. Uh, but eventually, you know, e to the minus 137, if you wanted to compute something to that accuracy, you would have to do something non-perturbatively. So you can't do an expansion in the fine structure constant. In this case, you can't do an expansion in 1 over s. So that's what non-perturbative means. Um, okay, uh, so this is uh, the reason, as I said, that, you know, uh, the computation itself is not precise enough. Uh, but someone could say, you know, what about what about the principle of ignorance, right? So what about the principle of ignorance? And and what I want to do uh, in today's lecture is actually address this issue. Uh, this is actually a conceptually pretty important issue, and uh, it's something that I think uh, often leads to confusion. And so I'd like to address uh, this issue, and then uh, hopefully we can uh, also address uh, uh, we can uh, conclude this discussion and go to. Uh, other issues, uh, but I first wanted to spend some time just explaining, you know, why this intuition from the principle of ignorance is also not sufficient uh, to lead to a paradox. Uh, so the first thing we could try and do is, you know, we could try and frame this principle of ignorance more precisely. Right? The principle of ignorance tells us that, you know, if you have a black hole, the observer outside uh, doesn't really know much about the black hole. Uh, but we know that's not exactly true because even classically, the observer outside always has information about the conserved charges of the black hole. And in fact, Hawking discussed this in his paper. At some point, we, we, we read this and we, we, we went through this passage. And, and the point is that, that the intuition that Hawking was using uh, was that there is a no hair theorem uh, for black holes. And the no hair theorem uh, tells us that, that you know, black holes are characterized uh, by a few conserved charges. So they're characterized by M, uh, J, and Q. Uh, you might have other uh, conserved charges in the theory, and then you would need to characterize uh, those uh, charges as well. Uh, but the Noya theorem tells you that you know if you take a black hole, uh, initially the black hole forms. Uh, there's some gravity wave. There's some gravity waves that are emitted, and there's a lot of violence in the geometry. At some point, uh, the geometry tends to settle down. Uh, it approaches a geometry that's stationary. Uh, in the stationary phase, uh, the solution uh, there's no matter around anymore, uh, the because everything has either fallen in or gone out. Uh, and in the stationary phase, uh, the black hole is characterized uh, by the mass, uh, the angular momentum, and uh, some conserved charges. Okay? Uh, and uh, the claim is that you know, we accept, and even Hawking pointed out, that you know, clearly the observer outside does have information about uh, these uh, conserved charges. Right? The observer outside does know about the mass, the angular momentum, and the charge. Uh, but those are just three numbers. And even if the observer had some information about the mass as a function of time, uh, you know, that's not sufficient uh, to uh, 
capture all the initial data that fell into the black hole. Uh, as we pointed out, even in quantum field theory and curve spacetime, uh, you could have had excitations of these B modes. And if you only knew the total energy in the B modes, it would not be sufficient to reconstruct uh, the state of the B modes or exactly what fell in. Okay? So uh, the, the, this is uh, one way in which one could try and make the principle of ignorance precise. One could say, look, black holes obey a no hair theorem. Okay? Uh, now, uh, the first thing which I want to emphasize, and this is actually a very important point, is that the no-hair theorem is a classical result. Okay? Uh, the no-hair theorem is, I, I want to emphasize, this is a classical result. Okay? And there is no analog of the no-hair theorem in quantum mechanics. Okay? In quantum mechanics, if you wanted to describe the state of the black hole, even in canonical gravity, what you would have to do is you would have to give a wave function uh, for the metric. And there is absolutely no result that states that the wave function for the metric is characterized in terms of these three charges, which are M, J, and Q. Okay? Now, I want to also emphasize that this is not some technical point. Okay? This is not some, some uh, I mean, I'm not uh, uh, arguing here from the perspective of a mathematician uh, who's saying that, you know, look, there is no proof. Uh, there is actually a very significant difference between uh, classical physics and between quantum physics when one looks at information. And, and so when I say that the no hair theorem is a classical result and it's not a quantum mechanical result, uh, this is not just a point about lack of information. This is a substantive point about the fact that quantum mechanically, we do expect uh, the geometry uh, to have much more information uh, than these three numbers. Okay. Uh, let me try and explain first why we expect that quantum mechanically uh, there not only is no analog of the no hair theorem, but there will, I mean, we do not expect that there will ever be an, an analog of the no hair theorem. And let me try and explain why that is the case. Okay. So, uh, so the, the claim I want to make is that we, we never expect, so we never expect a quantum no hair theorem. Now, why, why do I say that? So let me just go back and remind you, you know, why it is that even classically in gravity, uh, we expect to see the mass and the charge and the angular momentum outside. Okay? So the reason is actually a pretty simple, you know, why do we expect to see the mass of the black hole outside? Uh, you know, why is it that you can't hide the mass of the black hole? And that's because even in classical physics, uh, there's something uh, that we learned in high school, which one of the first things we learn when you learn uh, gravity, uh, learn anything about gravity is that, you know, gravity obeys a Gauss law. Okay? So if you have some mass here, uh, you have some mass here, there is a, there's a Gauss law and the Gauss law tells you that the integral of the gravitational field on some Gaussian surface far away uh, is given by, uh, you know, just by, uh, is, tells you the mass uh, that's inside this Gaussian surface. Okay. Uh, there is a more precise way to state this Gauss law. And in fact, in general relativity, uh, if uh, for those of you who've uh, looked at, uh, at the definition of energy in general relativity, in fact, the only good way to define the energy of a space time in GR is to go to asymptotic infinity and use the Gauss law. Okay? More precisely, there is what's called an ADM expression uh, for the energy, uh, which tells you that if you take this, I'm writing down the expression in flat space, which tells you that if you take the metric and you write it as, as flat space. Uh, so this is in four dimensions and there's a generalization in higher dimensions. Uh, but uh, this NJ here is just the outward pointing normal vector on some surface at infinity. Okay? So you, you go very far away. And HIJ is the deviation of the metric away from the flat metric. Okay? So the way this formula works is you go very, very far away from the black hole or whatever else is happening. And uh, you demand that the space time is asymptotically flat very far away. So that's the statement that if you go very far away, the space time looks like Minkowski space. And then you say, well, but it can't be exactly like Minkowski space. In fact, we expect that there are some uh, corrections uh, to what the space time is doing. Those corrections are captured by this HIJ. Okay, so these are deviations. Uh, we'll write down some more precise formula, but these are the deviations uh, from the flat metric far away. And those deviations fall off in a certain way uh, in four dimensions. Those deviations just fall off as one over R. And then you take a derivative of uh, how those deviations are. There's some formula. And basically, you integrate the deviation of the metric away from the flat metric on the Gaussian surface at infinity. And that gives you a definition of the energy. 
And this is not only a manifestation of the Gauss law in general relativity, it is actually the only way you can define the energy in general relativity. Uh, if you open Mr. Thorn and Wheeler, there is a long discussion on why you cannot define a local notion of energy. MTW says, you know, the concept of a local notion of energy in gravity uh, doesn't make sense. And it is true uh, that a good way, the only good way really to define a notion of energy is, is, this, is by using this Gauss law. But in any case, the point is that if you go far away, there is a version of the Gauss law in GR as well. And that tells you that you can measure the energy by looking at the deviation of the metric away from flat space and doing a particular integral uh, when you're far away. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, the point is that, that yeah, this is also something that you expect will hold in, in quantum mechanics. Right? So you expect that in quantum mechanics, uh, you can measure, uh, once again, the energy of the black hole uh, when you're very far away. However, there is an important difference in the quantum case and the classical case. Okay? So let us say, you know, we've been talking about these states. Let's say, you know, uh, we have some theory of quantum gravity. We've learned uh, how to uh, work out string theory uh, very nicely in, uh, and, you know, we know how to define it non-perturbatively in flat space. And we have some theory of quantum gravity. And in that theory of quantum gravity, uh, somebody tells us, you know, here is a black hole uh, that's formed from collapse. And now, you know, I want you to compute various quantities about this black hole. So what is the state that corresponds to this black hole that's formed from collapse? The state that corresponds to this black hole that's formed from collapse must be some superposition of different energy eigenstates. Okay. Now, why can this, can this state not be uh, an energy eigenstate itself? It cannot be an energy eigenstate itself because remember, we said that we want to look at a black hole formed from collapse. I mean, that is our interest in the information paradox. It is to look at a black hole that is formed from collapse and then evaporates. If you have a black hole which is formed from collapse and then evaporates, it clearly cannot be an energy eigenstate because energy eigenstates don't evolve with time. Right? If you're in an energy eigenstate, the system, you know, state of the world uh, just stays constant with time. So if you have a black hole that's formed from collapse and evaporates, it must be a superposition of distinct energies. Okay. It has to be. Uh, otherwise, uh, there would be no dynamics at all. Okay. So this is the first point, that in quantum mechanics, a black hole cannot have a given mass. It must be a superposition of distinct energies. In fact, we know that you know, it, the amount of the spread of the energy has to do with the fact has to do with how much time it took for the, the, the geometry to collapse. And therefore, you have to have a certain spread of energies. Otherwise, you cannot have a black hole formed from collapse. Okay. Sorry. No. Yeah. So this question. This, uh, these energy uh, levels are with respect to the APM Hamiltonian? Yes. So, the, so these energy levels, so right now I'm not writing something precise. Yes, they're with respect to the ADM Hamiltonian or whatever the Hamiltonian of the full theory of quantum gravity is. Okay. So uh, uh, what I'm, uh, I'm just saying is that Let's say you have some definition of the theory of quantum gravity. In that theory of quantum gravity, you have some energy levels. Uh, this state of the black hole, which is formed from collapse, must be a superposition of those energy levels. Uh, if you want to think of something very precise, you could think of ADS-CFT. Uh, there is some boundary theory. Uh, in that boundary theory, you could ask, what is the state uh, that is dual to a black hole that's formed from collapse? And you know that state must be a superposition of energy eigenstates. And this, and uh, this state is a state not, not only of the matter, of the whole space-time as well, the whole geometry. So can you say once again, please? The state is a full quantum gravity state. Is that correct? Or just the state of a matter of... A... No, the state is a full quantum gravity state. Okay. Thank you. So, so it's, it's, there's some full quantum gravity state. And so, uh, so uh, maybe I shouldn't write... Uh, so I, I, you know, this expression right now uh, is not a very precise expression. I haven't told you. We are not trying to make, I'm just going to make a very simple point using this expression, but it's true that, you know, if you take the full state of the, the full quantum gravity state, you must have a superposition of energy eigenstates. And we expect that this ADM Hamiltonian uh, will give us at least some approximation. To uh, so, yeah, go on, yeah. so you're saying any time, uh, any state with changes with time can't be in an energy eigenstate, is it? Correct. So that, that doesn't, that doesn't require it to be a black hole space time, right? If, even for uh, any. Yeah, for any state, if you, if it's an energy eigenstate, it can't be it can't be changing with time. Yeah, sure. So you're saying I I can't put a holographic CFT in an energy eigenstate? You can. It would just be a static state. It would not correspond to a black hole that forms from collapse and evaporates. Or or any any dynamical space time, right? Yeah, you know, we we want to look at a black hole that forms from collapse and that evaporates. Such a state cannot be an energy eigenstate because it's clearly evolving with time. You know, first there was some no black hole, then there was a black hole. Now it evaporated. So for the information paradox, we are interested in a black hole that formed from collapse. That's not an energy eigenstate. 
you could put a theory in an energy eigenstate. That's not a that's not a black hole that formed from collapse and that evaporates. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, uh, I hope there's no uh, confusion about this. If there is, I'm happy to address this. You know, if you, we, we want to look at a black hole, which, which, which you know, uh, all the diagrams we've been drawing are Penrose diagrams where, I mean, even this Penrose diagram, we drew is like a Penrose diagram where in the past there was no black hole, right? So there was some matter, which I didn't draw, but there was some matter which formed something. So this matter which, which fell in uh, clearly has to be a superposition of energy. I so I, I'm confused. Would, would you say like, uh, you can't put a CFT or, I mean, if you, this, uh, if you put a CFT in an energy eigenstate, it will it will evolve with time, right? It'll evolve trivially with time. It'll evolve like with the phase with time. I mean, evolution, short, time evolution just e to the minus i h t, right? So, and if you take an energy eigenstate, it evolves with time, and then it evolves trivially with time, right? I mean, yeah, but e I'm confused about like you. Usually, you would think of uh, like a simple particle moving; it's a evolving uh, state, but. Uh, I'm not sure the confusion is, but you know, this is just the Schrodinger equation, right? If you have an energy eigenstate, it evolves in this way. So it's just, just a phase. So if you really take an energy eigenstate, it doesn't do anything. You know, it just, it just evolves to e to the minus i e t. If you want to see dynamics, you have to take a superposition of one energy eigenstate and another energy eigenstate. And then the relative phase is meaningful. The overall phase is not meaningful. Okay. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, we, I mean, maybe, yeah. It, uh, what, I, what I wrote down right now is just the Schrodinger uh, equation. So. You compute the expectation value of any observable, you evolve the state, it just evolves with a phase, so all expectation values uh, stay fixed. It's pretty clear. Excuse me, quick, quick question. Um, yeah. So we're talking about, I guess it's of a Hamiltonian, which is um, not a local Hamiltonian. It's either it ADM Hamiltonian or something else, but not a, a local Hamiltonian. Correct. Because we cannot even define a local Hamiltonian in any theory of quantum gravity. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So if you if if you want to think of this very precisely, think of a CFT. Think of ADS CFT and think of a you know state which is formed and uh, think of a small black hole that forms and evaporates in ADS CFT, which is a process we can think of. Uh, that small black hole that forms and evaporates can have approximately some energy, but it cannot be an exact energy eigenstate. That's all I said right now. Okay. Uh, if it was an exact energy eigenstate, it would not be something that forms and evaporates. Okay. But now, uh, uh, so that th there are a couple of other questions. Uh, okay. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. One one question is. In, in case of an eternal black hole in ADS, it can be an energy eigenstate. An eternal black hole in ADS uh, could be, I mean, we don't have an eternal black hole in ADS generally corresponds to something else to an entangled state of two uh, CFTs. Uh, we don't actually have a good understanding of what the dual of an energy eigenstate is, but uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we're not discussing eternal black holes right now. We are discussing black holes which form and evaporate. So uh, yeah, so, so uh, maybe we can postpone that question to several lectures from now. Okay. And, and this, and this and another question was asking, can the subspace of definite energy be higher dimensional? In QFT, initial states are also eigenstates of energy, yet there is no non-trivial scattering with, within the subspace of same energy. Uh, I'm not sure what the, what the question is, but you know, uh, sometimes in a, uh, 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 can't they be higher dimensional? I'm not sure what higher dimensional means. Uh, uh, high dimensional in what sense? I mean, the, the question just states, can, can the subspace of definite energy be higher dimensional? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe if the person unmutes and asks, we can uh, discuss. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what higher dimensional means. It it could be higher dimensional. Oh, you mean you could have, yeah, you could have superpositions of, I'm not saying the energy eigenstates are not degenerate or something. You could have many energy eigenstates. Uh, but if you have an energy eigenstate, it just evolves this way. Okay. Uh, okay, good. Uh, so, so, uh, 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 so, uh, uh, so we have a superposition of energy eigenstates. I actually wanted to make a very simple point, and the simple point is is, is the following. You see, in quantum mechanics, you can of course measure the expectation of h in this energy in the superposition of energy eigenstates that I wrote down, right? And what is the expectation of h? The expectation of h is just sum of here ei squared ei. Right? That's all, and that that just comes by saying, well, let me go far away. Let me make a measurement of the metric. Uh, you know, whenever you measure expectation values, uh, the only way you can measure expectation values is you, you have to have a large number of identically prepared systems. Uh, when you make a measurement in quantum mechanics, uh, you would never get it, or you know, very rarely get a definite result. In this case, you will not get a definite result. You will sometimes get E1, sometimes get E2, you'll get 
uh, all the energy levels that make up the black hole in different ways. And then you take the average and the average gives you this. And that's the expectation value of H. And presumably in the classical theory, this is what you should substitute uh, when you see the mass, right? That's it's uh, when you talk about the mass of a black hole, uh, you're talking about the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And in fact, you could make this spreading energy is pretty small compared to the mass itself. And so, you know, it could be that, you know, there isn't even uh, that there's some spreading energies, but in the classical theory, all these EIs are pretty close to each other. And therefore there's a well-defined classical notion of what the energy is. And that is this expectation value of H. Okay? But let me point out that quantum mechanically, you can measure more than the expectation value of H. In particular, quantum mechanically in QM, we also get to measure, get to measure other observables, which in this case, for instance, I also get to measure H squared psi. Okay. What does this mean? This means I make a measurement of the energy. When I make a measurement of the energy, I square it and then I take the average. What is H squared psi? H squared psi is just is the same kind of quantity, but it's this. Okay. And I want to emphasize that this is not the same as psi H psi the whole squared. Okay. It may be close to psi H psi the whole squared, but it is not the same as psi H psi the whole squared. If these AIs are, are focused around a small band of energies, it may be close, but it is not exactly the same. Okay. In fact, in the thermal state, we do expect spreads in energies. We in fact do expect that the spread in energy is suppressed compared to the mean energy and it's once again suppressed by some power of s but there is some non-trivial expectation of you know spread in energy and in quantum mechanics that's something that you're forced to contend with okay? so you see already that in the state there has to be more information which is available at infinity this information is also coming from infinity it's coming from outside the black hole and that's because you measure this ADM Hamiltonian far away and you can measure, you know, it's a quantum mechanical observable in any sensible theory of quantum gravity. You measure it and you clearly get to measure not only the expectation value of H, but also the expectation value of H squared, provided this metric makes sense, at least as a quantum mechanical observable. And you do expect that, you know, at least to some order, to some precision, maybe not non-perturbatively, but at least to some precision, uh, the metric makes sense as a quantum mechanical observable. And if it does make sense as a quantum mechanical observable, you see clearly that there is more information than just its expectation value. You also get expectation values, you know, the square of the energy and other higher moments of the energy. In, in fact, uh, if you were to make uh, do, uh, you know, ask how much information do you have in quantum mechanics, uh, you have information about the probability that you will get when you make a measurement of the energy that you will get an answer between E and E plus delta. And this probability is just this. So it's it's uh, it's a probability. You just sum these coefficients uh, over e and e plus delta, and this is the probability uh, that you will get an answer between e and e plus delta. And there is no analog of this information classically. Classically, the black hole has a given mass, and you know it's it, it, there's a mass which is just conserved, and you don't have you're not forced to contend with some uncertainty in the mass. Okay? So there is no analog. There is no classical analog of this. So you see already that, that we have more information quantum mechanically than we have classically. Okay? So already, if somebody were to say, you know, uh, the wave function of the black hole is characterized by three numbers, uh, some expectation value of the energy and, you know, the expectation value of the charge and the expectation value of the angular momentum, we see already that that's not something that can be correct. At least you have to tell me about the probability distribution of the energy. Uh, you have to tell me about the probability distribution of the charge and the probability distribution of the angular momentum. And so, you know, at least we see immediately from this extremely simple and trivial example, uh, what I said right now was very simple. You know, we had discussions about EDS, CFT and eternal black holes and so on. But what I was saying was very simple. It was just the fact that quantum mechanically, you immediately see uh, that you must have information about the moments, higher moments of these conserved charges and not just the conserved charges themselves. Okay, So that clearly tells you that if you wanted to generalize the Nohe theorem, it would not be sufficient uh, to just say that you know you're, it's characterized by three numbers. At least you have to give an infinite number of numbers or if not infinite, some large set of numbers that tell you what is the probability distribution of these conserved charges. Okay, okay that's point one. But remember that this is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story because say, Let's say we have say that O is some other observable, okay, which is not a conserved charge. 
so maybe O is uh, the value of a field. Okay. So maybe O is maybe O is like phi at r tends to infinity. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is that you you know you if you look at some scalar field, some massless field, it has some die, it has some fall off. That is one over r. And then you can ask, you know, what is the one over r term at r goes to infinity? So this is when I say uh, O is phi. I don't mean literally phi. You can ask what's the subleading term in a scalar field, just like you can ask what's the subleading term in the metric. And then you you know maybe you measure you measure this the scalar field, and you see that quantum mechanically, you know, even if expectation value of O is zero, we can ask about you can ask about correlators of this O with the Hamiltonian. So you can ask about correlators of this kind. And these correlators are not the same as the expectation value of the energy and the expectation value of O. So it may be that you know uh, there are some scalar field that propagates in the geometry. And the scalar field in general you know, has some fluctuations because quantum mechanically there are always some fluctuations. And maybe the average value of the scalar field is zero, but you can ask about the correlators of the scalar field with the with the Hamiltonian, and that's not the same as looking at the expectation value of O and H. You could look at the square of the scalar field and ask for correlators of that with the Hamiltonian, which would give you some measure of you know how much the scalar field is fluctuating, and that fluctuation itself may depend on the energy. And so you see, you have a whole set of new correlators in quantum mechanics that you did not have to worry about classically. Classically, you only had to worry about the expectation values. And you know, we could argue that these expectation values tend to universal values, uh, all these scalar fields and so on. If you go far away, all, all of them tend to zero. Uh, there is some, uh, some other energy. Uh, this energy uh, tends to some, you know, uh, after the gravity waves have settled down, this energy just tells you the energy of the black hole. And that's all we had to worry about classically. But quantum mechanically, you have to worry about all of these correlation functions. And not only do you have to worry about the correlation functions, let's say somebody tried to prove uh, an OHA theorem of the following kind. The person said that, you know, I'm, I've proved a theorem that says that all of these at late times, late times tend to some universal value. Okay. So the person says, well, you're right. I need to take care of these correlators. But in fact, I have proved that all these correlators tend to some universal value. But you could ask the person, you know, you would have to prove that all of these correlators not only tend to a universal value, but they tend to a universal value up to corrections of order e to the minus s by two. Okay? So if if somebody does prove, so you know this is a uh, this this statement is a hypothetical statement. Okay? Uh, it's a statement that somebody comes to us and tells us that they've proved the quantum version of the Nohe theorem. And the question we could ask them is, you know, is this is this accurate up to e to the minus s by two corrections? Because if it was the case, and in fact, we do expect it to be the case that these correlators, apart from these conserved, uh, the moments of conserved charges, that these other correlators would tend to some universal values uh, because, you know, these other correlators obey the same statistical mechanics constraints that we derived earlier. So we do expect that these other correlators would tend to universal values. But once again, we expect that the information is stored in exponentially small values of these correlators. Right? And, you know, almost certainly uh, no one has, has proved uh, no one has even proved the box statement, uh, but if someone did prove the box statement, they would have to prove it up to order e to the minus s by two, uh, which has not uh, been done and uh, is very unlikely that it can be done. So I want to point out that the fact that quantum mechanically there is no no hair theorem is not a technicality. You know, even classically, uh, people ask about you know how, what what is the proof you have of the no hair theorem, and mathematicians discuss uh, proofs of the no hair theorem. Uh, but quantum mechanically, the obstacles are much more formidable. Uh, you have to contend with many issues. Uh, we see immediately you have to contend with the moments of the charge. And then you have to contend with all these other quantum mechanical correlators uh, of the kind that I have written on the blackboard, or correlators of the energy and other observables. And even if you prove that they go to universal values, you would have to prove that those universal values don't have e to the minus s by two fluctuations, because if they did, that would be enough to preserve information. Okay. So there is a real reason why we don't have a quantum no head theorem. Okay. So there is, you know, uh, that's why there's no quantum no hair theorem. Okay, so this intuition from the no hair theorem is not sufficient uh, to argue that the black hole loses information. I want to say this in a few other ways, uh, but if there are any questions at this point, I'm happy to take them because you know the no hair theorem is something that in popular descriptions of the information paradox is often invoked, and people say you know look there's a no hair theorem that tells you there's no information in the geometry outside, 
uh, but that's not correct because quantum mechanically there is no no head theorem and we don't expect a no head theorem uh, so can you repeat this part about the corrections the c to the power yeah. times uh, so so this this was uh, uh, this is uh, uh, so so let's say an ambitious uh, uh, mathematician okay so, so ambitious let's say uh, this is a hypothetical dialogue okay the ambitious mathematician tells us uh, i have proved uh, the following statement i have proved that the uh, uh, correlators of the hamilton you know i said that apart from moments you had to keep track of correlators of the hamiltonian and other observables and the ambitious mathematician tells us you know i've proved that correlators of the hamiltonian and other observables at late time go to universal values okay uh, now the question we could ask the ambitious mathematician is uh, is your proof does your proof take into account non perturbative corrections because by the same reason that we gave previously uh you know um so e to the minus s by 2 terms um in ho so ho is not one observable in ho uh, where you know o or where o can comprises like o is stands is some observ is is a set of observables outside the horizon okay or it's a shorthand for observables outside the horizon these kinds of terms are sufficient to preserve information about whether the state is pure or not right so you see that that it is not sufficient to argue that these correlators go to some universal values one has to argue that the correlators go to some universal values up to accuracy e to the minus s by 2 you know the the spirit of the no head theorems is that the geometry settles down the reason i'm saying it this way is that the spirit of the no head theorems is that the geometry settles down so somebody could try and prove or somebody could try and embark on a mission to prove that you know i'm going to prove that all correlators at late time settle down but if this person tries to do this the person would have to prove that they settle down and they don't you know they even lose their exponentially small tails they lose e to the minus s by 2 tails and that's very hard to do because you would have to work non perturbatively and in fact you know we will when we discuss paradoxes in ads and so on we will see that information is stored in these e to the minus s by 2 kinds of correlators so the difference between classical and quantum physics does in fact occur precisely at this level you know classically you might even find that there is some decay in some correlator and maybe you do like a few orders in perturbation theory and you find the correlator continues to decay but if it saturates at some value e to the minus s by 2 that is sufficient uh, to preserve information about the initial state and so this you know this ambitious mathematician uh, would have to keep track of non perturbative corrections Uh, if the person really wanted to prove a no head theorem and argue that the state is mixed okay so that that was that was the point of this uh, is this clear hmm. okay so I, i'm guessing it's clear uh, are there other yes, questions just one quick question how can you explain once again why that statement would be a quantum no head theorem uh, what, what can you explain again once again why in what sense the statement uh, would be a quantum no hair theory yeah uh, so let's say somebody was to prove that you know a black hole is characterized so you know so some, so you know we already argued there have to be moments of the energy but i said apart from moments of the energy you would have to give uh, you know you also have to worry about values of such correlators right because such correlators uh, are necessary uh, do you see what i'm marking uh, such correlators are necessary for characterizing the wave function so let's say somebody said well you know the final state in the final state all such correlators Uh, at late times go to universal values if that's the case then it would be the case that the final state kind of goes to a universal state right if all expectation values of observables go to some universal value then that's telling you the final state is going to uh, uh, some universal state right because the final state is characterized by all expectation values so if you wanted to prove that you know the final state was going to some kind of a universal thermal state regardless of what you started from uh, one way you could do it is by trying to prove that all correlators go to universal values and so this would be a natural way to try and prove a no head theorem because you know in in quantum mechanics uh, this is what characterizes the the state right? these different correlation functions that you can measure far away and so if you want to prove no head you have to show that the correlation functions uh, don't have any information or you know uh, they can go to they can take like one of 10 different values and and not some other uh, arbitrary values and so that's that's why i said that you know if you wanted to prove a no head theorem you would have to prove something of this kind is that clear Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Surat? Yes. Um I have one more question about the quantum gravity state. Yes. Um if I include gravity and matter shouldn't it be possible that it is in fact um an energy eigen state just that it is in a this the space of um 
of states with definite energy is is very large just like in qft you also have initial states of definite energy which involve two states with the same energy but of course they can scatter and and do yeah. other stuff so so when you ask about scattering matrix elements you're generally asking about the overlap of you know a, a fox space in the past and a fox space in the future okay. uh, but you know it's still true that if you take an exact energy eigenstate like you take the full interacting hamiltonian and you put everything in an exact energy eigenstate uh, then you know just the schrodinger equation tells you that the exact and even if it's a superposition of different you know angular momenta within the uh, energy eigenstate uh, just the schrodinger equation tells you that you know an energy eigenstate if quantum mechanics is correct just goes to the energy eigenstate times a phase uh, so you know if if this energy eigenstate is an eigenstate of the full hamiltonian uh, then uh, you know it just evolves up to a phase uh, and uh, you know if you know it could be sometimes you know you could talk about some approximate energy eigenstate and that would not uh, stay fixed in time but if you took the full energy eigenstate of the full hamiltonian of the theory uh, you know clearly that that just uh, stays fixed right that that cannot represent some process where you have a black hole that forms and and, and evaporates it, that has to you have to have some superpositions that that lead to that that give you dynamics i mean uh, the, the, uh, all I'm, i'm just using the, the schrodinger equation to make the statement that if you have an exact energy eigen state so all all i wanted to say was that you know black holes have to have black holes have to have a spread in energies uh, the the only reason i i said this was uh, to argue that black holes have to have a spread in energies uh, so maybe this is not something that we we emphasize but you know if you start exactly with an energy eigen state uh, you you know you might uh, so uh, you, you know so you can ask of course about you know what is the overlap between uh, one description of the energy eigen state and another description of the energy eigen state uh, which is the kind of question we ask Uh, but if you wanted to prepare you know if you if you wanted to ask a physical question about you know here you have some wave packets which go and you know they scatter and something else happens uh, you would have to prepare them in a superposition of energy eigen states not in some plane wave energy eigen states so if you and if you think about it you know you, you think of wave packets that actually move from one place to the other place are uh, they always superpositions they have to be just by this what i wrote here okay thank you yeah thank you Uh, okay uh, good so let me say this uh, another way okay uh, you see uh, 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 let, let me say this another way uh, uh, we said that there's no no good no head theorem but you know uh, there's another way you could say this so uh, i just want to emphasize this this thing in another way because this is uh, an important conceptual point you see uh, there's this penrose diagram that we drew and um uh, the qu the question is um so so here is here is a horizon Uh, and and the question is uh, let's say i draw i draw some uh, you know some 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 slice through the horizon as i did earlier okay. uh, uh you know the the next point that that I, that i want to make is that in a local quantum field theory it is possible uh, you know to change the interior of the slice to put some excitation here uh, without changing anything in the exterior in a theory of quantum gravity i want to point out that this is already something that is very difficult and this is actually uh, related to what i said previously about the nohe theorem uh, why it's difficult to hide information it's also something that we'll spend some amount of time on as we as we go along uh, but uh, uh, you know let's say uh, somebody wanted to you know prove that there was a principle of ignorance so now i'm trying to give you another example of why this argument of the principle of ignorance is not valid uh, let's say somebody wanted to prove that there was a principle of ignorance then that person would have to say look there are two kinds of states i can have inside the black hole uh, and i can prepare those two kinds of states in such a way that the observer here so let's say we have a little observer here uh, cannot in any way determine you know whether there is an excitation inside or there is no excitation inside okay so uh, i'm not going to give you a proof i'm just trying to point out obstacles we'll spend a few lectures later trying to uh, make these arguments more precise uh but you see let's say somebody was to say that you know i can prepare two kinds of states of the black hole one with something inside uh with an excitation inside one without an excitation inside uh so that the observer outside doesn't know then you see it would have to be the case it would have to be the case that so for so for the principle of ignorance to hold for the principle of ignorance or for hawking's principle of ignorance to be valid it must be there must exist some unitary in the full theory so once again i'm being schematic here but i just want to point out obstacles so i emphasize that you know the arguments that you see here 
a schematic, but we'll make them more rigorous later. But at this point, I'm just trying to point out the difficulties in trying to make this principle of ignorance uh, precise. Uh, and uh, so if, if, if there is a principle of ignorance, there must be a unitary U okay, such that U commutes with all operators outside. Right? Operators outside, but changes the inside. Right? Uh, is this statement clear? You, know, you see, if there has to be a principle of ignorance, and remember the principle of ignorance was that our little observer here you know, doesn't know what's happening inside the black hole. Uh, and if uh, that principle of ignorance has to hold, then there must be at least one unitary operator in the theory that changes the interior from one possibility to another possibility uh, and commutes with everything outside. So the observer outside is completely clueless about whether something happened inside, whether there was uh, you know whether this unitary is acted or not uh, and uh, you know therefore there this observer outside adopts a principle of ignorance and says well i don't know if the unitary acted or not let me trace over both possible states uh, i hope this statement is clear uh, that you know the only way you can have a principle of ignorance is, is if there is a unitary inside and i want to emphasize that in the absence of gravity there clearly is or there clearly are many such unitaries there clearly are many such unitaries because you know in the absence of gravity um, it is, you know, in quantum field theory, there are clearly many unitaries that act inside, which commute with everything outside. You just take a Cauchy slice, you make up a unitary out of some local fields on one part, it commutes with all local fields and everywhere else in the Cauchy slice. And so there are many such unitaries, but you see already the fact that you can measure the energy from outside uh, leads you into some trouble with the existence of any such unitary in a theory of quantum gravity. And the, the difficulty is that we want a unitary, which has the property that psi u dagger O out u psi is equal to psi O out psi for all observables O out, right? This is the precise statement that our observer outside cannot make out what is happening inside uh, because you know you acted with the unitary in the state and you change the state in the observer outside. All expectation values stayed exactly the same for the observer outside. Okay, good. But now you see one of the observables the observer outside can measure is also the energy itself. Right? So if this unitary is going to keep all observables outside fixed, it must be the case that it also keeps the energy fixed. So it must be the case that u dagger h u is equal to h because it must keep the energy and moments of the energy fixed. And that can only happen if it commutes with the energy. Okay? So u must commute with the energy, must commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. But now we are in trouble because if U commutes with the Hamiltonian, uh, we learned uh, in, in elementary quantum mechanics that if something has zero energy, it cannot have localized position. That's just the uncertainty principle. If U commutes with the Hamiltonian, you cannot be localized to the black hole interior because if it is localized to the black hole interior, then it would also be the case that, you know, it would have some uncertainty because its position of this excitation that you create by you uh, is, is limited. The uncertainty in the position is limited. Therefore, there must be some corresponding uncertainty in the momentum. If there is some corresponding uncertainty in the momentum, uh, there must be some corresponding uncertainty that this unitary U creates in the Hamiltonian or in the energy. Okay? So if U commutes with the Hamiltonian, it cannot be purely localized in the interior. And if it is not purely localized in the interior, it must change some observable outside. Okay. So there is no notion in, there is no, I mean, so this is once again, not a proof, but this already suggests, and later we will try and make it more precise, uh, that there is no unitary operator U you can find in a theory of quantum gravity, which has the property that it commutes with all operators outside. This sometimes uh, goes under the name, uh, uh, this sometimes uh, goes under the name that there are no gauge invariant, exa or exactly local gauge invariant operators in gravity. And I'm going to explain that in a, in a third way. Uh, but I wanted to check if this argument uh, that I've given right now is clear. Let me just try and repeat the argument once. Okay? I'll go to the previous slide and I'll repeat the argument. You see, the argument is that let's say somebody wanted to make Hawking's principle of ignorance precise. The principle of ignorance was that our, our friendly observer here uh, doesn't have any clue about what's happening inside the black hole. 
And if that is the case in the quantum theory, if somebody wanted to make that precise, uh, then uh, the observer would have to, you know, then th there would have to be at least one unitary U, uh, which, and so that this unitary U commutes with the expectation value of all observables that this observer can measure outside, but it changes something inside. And if that were to happen, then there would be a principle of ignorance for the operator, for the observer outside, because the observer outside would not know whether something had changed inside or not. So the principle of ignorance can only hold if there is at least some unitary U that has this property, where O out is an observable outside the black hole. Uh, and there is a sense in which you have a unitary U which commutes with all observables outside the black hole. In particular, one such observable outside the black hole is H. H is an observable outside the black hole by what, what we said. So it must be the case that the unitary commutes with it. So because you commute with the Hamiltonian, it has zero energy. But if it has zero energy, it cannot be localized in some finite region. And if you draw a nice slice through the black hole, this nice slice, I mean, can stretch for a long distance. But in the end, it's a finite nice slice. And it, you know, you cannot be localized entirely to the interior part of the nice slice. If it is not purely localized in the interior, then it must fail to commute with some operator outside. So you see already that we have trouble in trying to find even one operator which exactly commutes with operators outside. Okay. Why does zero energy imply that uh, it uh, cannot be localized inside? Uh, because be if you have some excitation which has zero energy, so uh, if an excitation is localized to some finite region, uh, then you know just by the uncertainty principle, the only way you can localize it is by building up some momentum eigenstates. Uh, so um, this is, uh, uh, you know, you have to have some uncertainty in the momentum. If you have some uncertainty in the momentum, you expect to have some uncertainty in the energy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you're right that I haven't, I haven't proved this statement. This statement is not a proof. Uh, uh, but uh, you see that, you know, uh, we will, we will try and make a more precise statement later. Uh, but you see, uh, this is the intuitive reason uh, why, uh, I mean, this intuitive reason just comes from the uncertainty principle. It's the fact that if you localize in position, uh, then uh, you have to delocalize in uh, in momentum. If you delocalize in momentum, you have to delocalize in energy. So you can't have an excitation that's localized in some region that has exactly zero energy. Um, uh, we we will make that a little more precise uh, later. Uh, uh, can I ask a question? So the intuition is clear. Yeah. So uh, while discussing this Klein-Gordon equations in this black hole background, yeah. we had these uh, uh, some modes inside this uh, horizon that did not have any relation to the modes outside, right? Mm -hmm. So can't those modes uh, change the state of the- uh, No, they interior? don't commute with the Hamiltonian, notice. Uh, so uh, uh, th those modes, uh, th we had these A tilde, uh, oops, sorry. We had these A tilde omega modes. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I, I don't know if I said this. Uh, these A tilde omega modes have the wrong commutator with the Hamiltonian. Uh, um, I think maybe they have a plus sign, uh, sorry. Uh, but they don't commute with the Hamiltonian because remember these A tilde omega modes multiply something which goes like, e to the i omega t. Okay. So if you right. if you make some time translation outside, the a tilde omega modes change. So if you act with a tilde omega modes, you don't you don't not change anything outside. You have to change the energy outside. Oh. Okay. So the a tilde omega modes also leave some imprint outside when you act with them. So there's no way you can combine the modes in such a way so as to get something that's that just exactly commutes with the Hamiltonian. You could have said, you know, why can't I act with A tilde omega into A omega dagger? And then you would run into trouble with the fact that, you know, if you try to integrate the field inside, you would always have some uncertainty in the frequency. Uh, because, you know, if you try to in integrate the field on the interior part of the black hole, uh, you would always not be able to extract an exact energy eigenstate because you're integrating over a finite region. And therefore, even if you try to take A tilde omega into A omega into A tilde omega dagger, which would be better than trying to take just A tilde omega, uh, you would still not have something that has exactly zero energy. It would have some small energy. And that just comes from, as I said, the uncertainty principle. If you take the field and you integrate it over a finite part of the region, you can't get something that's exact, that exactly commutes with the energy. Right. And all I want to point out at this point is, you know, if you wanted to make this principle of ignorance precise, uh, you do want something that exactly changes, some, that changes something inside and doesn't change something outside, even to exponential accuracy. And uh, we see that it's very hard to do this. So I, I want to emphasize once more, I'm just pointing out why this intuition is not good enough to argue that you, you get a paradox. Uh, sorry, Sufrat. Yeah. Can I still have a principle of ignorance by saying, okay, I just have to commute with everything outside except the Hamiltonian? Ah, 
so uh, you could uh, good but you see if you if you commuted with if uh, so you would you commute with everything outside except uh, for the hamlet so you change something uh, but you only change uh, it and nothing else uh, exactly. but then do you change uh, but you also change then the expectation values of it with o right so you change like correlators of h with o and you change so the observer outside by measuring these correlators uh, uh, knows about uh, what is happening inside right you could you could you could try and do something like that but you would have but you would you would uh, you would have to transmit some information to the observer outside because uh, uh, you would you know h as i said uh, is not only a number h also has prob joint probability distributions with other observables and with uh, you know h squared and so on so there are many numbers you would change outside but but still that that could be still fewer numbers than the information that i don't have access to uh, yeah it could be so this is not a proof that you have access uh, to all information outside i so let me emphasize uh, at some point uh, later we will try and make a proof that the principle of ignorance uh, actually goes to something else uh, we we i am we will try and argue that this gets totally reversed to something called the holo that we'll call the holography of information Uh, and uh, so far i have not given a proof the argument i gave right now is not a proof because uh, you could argue that you know maybe uh, it doesn't change uh, uh, as monica just did uh, that you know maybe this uh, operator outside changes h this operator inside it changes h uh, if it changes h it also changes uh, you know correlators of h with other observables maybe in all sorts of ways uh, but you know i have not yet argued that uh, you don't have uh, maybe there's still some there's some information that gets lost uh and so so maybe uh, yeah indeed that that might be the case uh but what i want to point out is that you know uh, uh if you uh yeah if you wanted to make the principle of ignorance precise you would run into all of these difficulties and you would have to argue uh, up to e to the minus s by 2 that there was a principle of ignorance and you would have to contend with all of this uh this is also what you know i said about the the no hair theorem when i said that uh you know there was a no known quantum no hair theorem i said that you know if some ambitious mathematician tried to prove a no hair theorem the person would have to work up to order e to the minus s by 2 uh, that's not a proof that the person can't do it you know maybe someone could do it uh, but i just want to point out that there is a difficulty there and there's also a difficulty here okay, um, thanks does that answer the question monica yeah thank you okay yeah so i i i want to emphasize that this is not, uh, we have we have not uh, proved this okay we have not proved this Can I ask uh, a question? Yeah. Prove this, but we have not proved it. Uh, we right now. I'm just trying to explain why the intuition is not sufficient to lead to a paradox, and why there are all these objections that one could raise. Go on, please. Yeah. So there, not, there was another question. I thought. Yeah, yeah. So do these uh, operators outside mean operators at asymptotic, asymptotic infinities? Uh, I was not so far using asymptotic infinity, but you could talk about operators at asymptotic infinity. Uh, I drew okay. my observer here. I was not being so precise, but uh, you could talk about observers at asymptotic infinity. I have a question. Yeah. Does that operator U not commute with operators arbitrarily far away from the black hole? Uh, so H is one operator which is actually defined at asymptotic infinity, and uh, it would be very hard to make U commute with H, uh, which is arbitrarily far away from the black hole. Uh, remember, when you measure, when you talk about operators far away from the black hole, there's some fall off in the field. So I don't know if that's what you're thinking of. you have to scale up the fields by by some power so if you're far away from the black hole you have to scale up the fields by a power of r okay so i mean there, there's some there's some fall off with you know if i i'm writing h here but really if you'd measure the metric which would fall off as 1 over r uh, and and you know so so you'd have to rescale that by a factor of r to get this energy okay okay does the yeah. argument with the uncertainty principle still work if the hamiltonian is a boundary term Uh yeah I think so um so you're right that you know you could ask all of these questions you could ask can I have an operator which is localized and which has zero energy uh so that's why uh, let, let me emphasize we have not proved this uh uh yeah so uh, I at this point I don't want to I'm not trying to argue that all the information is outside the black hole although in a few lectures from now I will try and make the argument uh, that there is the you know the true point is actually exactly the opposite uh that the principle of ignorance is replaced by uh, the some principle of information that the observer outside knows Uh, but i have not proved this and you know if i were to right now use this argument you could raise this you could raise the same objections in converse you could ask like the question that you asked uh, which is you know uh, uh, this is i i said you know answer the anti principle i wave my hands here and how do i know this is correct uh, but i i want to point out that you know uh, yeah all i'm saying right now is that the principle of ignorance clearly comes up against strong arguments 
uh, maybe and at this point you could say there's a loophole but if if someone wanted to make that loophole the onus would be on them to to show that there is you know a loophole in these strong arguments okay thanks uh, so at um, this point i i, I have not, we have not proved that all information is outside uh, so I, I want to emphasize that yeah i have a question uh, yeah. so uh, there's some discussion where like the to, in order to actually measure the energy the observer really have to go around the sphere and and any any realistic measurement of h is an average thing which happens over some time window right yeah. so technically this you only has to compute with an average quantity of h does that give you any h is an average quantity it is an average value of the metric no yeah over some time right uh, h is saying... not averaged over time it, you just measure it at one time no I, i mean like in order to actually measure the energy you have to calc do the integral over the sphere right because uh Uh, you have to right, do the so. integral of the sphere so you mean uh, yeah you have to do the integral of the sphere but you could have observers with like coordinated clocks to do the integral at one time oh, okay okay uh, so I, look i i I, say, i i just want to emphasize that if somebody wanted uh, these are uh, so i i want to say the following you know I, the way we started the argument uh, so maybe uh, is 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 a, is a, you know by saying that look there was some concrete computation that hawking did and then there was some intuition that hawking had the intuition came from the principle of ignorance i'm trying to point out why if you think so anyway there was no concrete computation behind the intuition and the principle of ignorance right it was that look you know it looks like we have this uh, space time inside and the observer outside doesn't have information and all i'm trying to point out is that you know the intuition could if you think a little more carefully in quantum gravity uh, the intuition could actually also run the other way in that you know you would find that the it's very hard you know if you wanted to justify or make the principle of ignorance precise it would be hard to do uh so uh, the objective of these discussions is not to make like loophole free arguments and uh, some of you uh, have valid questions uh, but is to point out that the you know the intu so far as we're using this as intuition uh, we are in trouble uh you know we could maybe there's a loophole we'll try and argue later that there is no loophole but uh, i'm just trying to point out what are the kinds of arguments and conceptual issues that we will come up against when we discuss later uh, this principle of holography of information So if you wanted to make a paradox you would have to make all of this precise you would have to say you know maybe you know you have something that commutes with h but not with other things and or maybe you know you can't measure h precisely and therefore you have a more accurate principle of ignorance uh, so you would have to do this or if you wanted to prove a noether theorem you would have to go up to exponential accuracy so uh, all of these and right now we have not proved this is not possible but there's no argument that that you know uh, makes any of these things precise either noether theorem or the principle of ignorance precise Yeah. So I'm uh, the spirit of this is clear. Yeah. So but there's a question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, Tony is asking what does u has zero energy mean? Uh you what does u have zero energy? It means that it commutes with the hamiltonian. It means precisely that. All right. And there's another I think it's a comment. It, it says yeah. it sounds like we are asking the black hole u to be both isolated and open system. I I, I don't understand that. I also don't Maybe. know what that means. I'm sorry. I don't know what it means to be both isolated and open. Uh, maybe uh, this whole whole world yeah. here is a closed system right okay i was wondering why um sorry i have a question why you need uh, gravity why can't you define the hamiltonian on asymptotic uh, infinity also in a local quantum field theory what is it uh, the hamiltonian is never defined at asymptotic infinity in any other theory except for gravity so the fact that the hamiltonian is is i mean it's it's very important in all of these issues that uh the hamilt you know there's a charge in gravity which is the energy that energy is defined by a gauss law far away uh, which is not true uh in any other theory okay so and the in thing is every other theory the hamiltonian is a local integral you have to do an integral over some over the cauchy slice and uh you know you can't measure the energy just by sitting far away okay and then so you're uh, so you're saying that if you make a perturbation in the interior of the black hole this will lead to a perturbation of the metric and this perturbation you can measure and therefore you can find out what has happened yeah uh, but yeah you can measure the perturbation so actually i have not proved that you can find out what has happened i just want to say you can measure the perturbation and you can measure moments of the perturbation and you can measure correlators of the perturbation of the metric with other observables so once you change something inside you're forced to change a lot of numbers outside uh, so that's all we have proved uh, i have not actually said you can so i uh, so i want to emphasize once more Uh, we have not actually said we can find out what can happen that would be a stronger statement which we will try and make that we will call the principle of holography of information but we'll have to make a much better argument than the argument i'm giving right now uh, so uh, and we will make a much better argument than the argument i'm giving 
Uh, but right now, I'm just trying to point out what the intuition is. I'm only trying to argue against the principle of ignorance, not trying to argue right now for the principle of information completely uh, uh, precisely, but just saying that, you know, look, if you, it's not the principle of ignorance is, is, is not as innocuous as it sounds. It's not that, oh, you know, so obviously the interior is inside and you can change something and the observer outside doesn't know what's happening. You have to be very careful about it. And I'm just pointing out what are the things you have to be careful about. Okay, but this, oh, the last thing I was wondering, this perturbation, do you know instantly, uh, like does the Hamiltonian change instantly if you make a perturbation inside there or you need to have to wait till the perturbation? You can never make a perturbation inside instantly because you have to throw in the perturbation from outside. You know, you can't violate local conservation of energy. So nothing changes instantly. It's the fact that if you make a perturbation from out, you know, if you make a perturbation, you have to throw in the perturbation from outside and it's that information that always stays. So it's not that it changes, uh, H is always what it is, uh, but uh, you know, uh, yeah. So it's it's not that, uh, yeah. So you know, if you think about it physically, any uh, there's a local there's some local conservation of energy. The energy can't suddenly appear in one place without having come from somewhere. In fact, that's related to the next point I want to make. Okay. So it's not that H changes instantly. It's that you know you have to you have to keep H constant all the time, and you have to throw in information, and that's the reason why you know some tail of that information stays outside, and so it's hard to. And that's the reason it's hard to change the inside without changing the outside, because you have to throw in something from outside. And when you throw in something from outside, you change some bunch of numbers outside. And that may be one physical way to think about it. Okay, let me say one more thing, which is related to some of the discussions uh, that we had. Okay, uh, so there's one more question, I think, which Akhil has. He's asking, uh, wasn't the intuition we had about localized observables having infinite energy? also based on cases when Hamiltonian density itself was local over a single time slice. Uh, yeah, uh, wasn't it based on the fact that the Hamilton, yeah, but you know, this, this, uh, this Hamilton that you measured energy is equal to in perturbation theory, the integral of the Hamilton density at, at times. You know, so that uh, if you, there's, there's a constraint uh, which in gravity relates the Hamilton that you measure to something which is equal to the local integral of the energy density. Otherwise it would not make sense. You know, it's not just that there's some metric outside which doesn't care about uh, the local energy that you're measuring. Uh, so there is a constraint. And so this, this fact that, you know, you can't have local observables is also true there. In fact, maybe if uh, some of these questions, if you could hold the questions for a few minutes, I'm going to give you another, yet another argument about uh, which will come to the same conclusion. Okay. Uh, so we want to make uh, uh, yet another argument, uh, which will, you know, we, we try to argue right now that it's hard to change the interior of the black hole without changing the exterior. Uh, but let me, let me try and make yet another argument from a third perspective. Uh, why this is the case. You see, uh, if you want to change uh, some operator, uh, something you have, uh, if you want to change some state of the interior and theory of gravity on any gauge theory, uh, remember you have to be careful that you're always acting with a gauge invariant operator. So let me remind you how things work in a gauge theory. So in a gauge theory, let's say you wanted to insert a charge at some point, right? If you wanted to insert a charge at some point, what is an operator which is charged? You see, an operator which is charged uh, is not gauge invariant because an operator which is charged uh, doesn't make sense because it, you know you act with that operator, it just violates uh, charge conservation. Uh, so you have to dress this operator. And the usual way you dress the operator, we dress charged operators using a Wilson line. Okay, using and the Wilson line it basically tells you that, you know, when you insert a charge at some point, you had to create some electric field, so you had to dress it in some way. And so if you insert a charge here, so there's a charged operator, and you have to take a Wilson line, and the Wilson line goes all the way out to infinity. Now, in a gauge theory, because you have negative charges as well, uh, you can take the Wilson line and you can end it on something else. You can end it on, on something else which has the opposite charge, and you could even consider Wilson loops. Right? In a gauge theory, it's also possible to consider like Wilson loops. So Wilson loops are just, you know, these are gauge invariant operators, which are just confined to some region where, you know, nothing runs off to infinity. But in a theory of gravity, uh, because energy is positive, whenever you have an operator, you know, you, you, this operator creates some excitation, you have to have a way of dressing the operator and you can't take that Wilson line, that gravitational Wilson line and just end it at some point that gravitational Wilson line has to run all the way out to infinity. Okay. So in gravity, 
the Wilson lines or the analog of the Wilson lines, they run to infinity. Okay. There's another way to say this. Uh, you know, if you wanted to, let's say you said that I want to act with some operator, right? I want to talk about an operator in the interior of the black hole and I want to act with some operator and change or create an excitation in the interior of the black hole, right? Uh, maybe you say that, you know, I have a scalar field phi and I act with, I act on the state psi and this X is in the interior. Okay? Now, the question is, you might have thought that phi is a scalar field and therefore phi of X is a gauge operator, but in fact, this is not the case, right? Because if you just took some coordinate system and you made some change of variables, then, you know, this phi would change, right? This phi would go to phi plus d mu phi into epsilon nu, right? And so under a diffeomorphism, if you just took a scalar field and you said, you know, let me evaluate the field at coordinate point 10, uh, this is not a diffeomorphism invariant observable. And this is the fact, you know, this has to do with the fact that this observable, which is a local observable, carries some charge under, you know, it, it carries some energy. And so it's not a diffeomorphism invariant observable. How do you make it diffeomorphism invariant? One way to make an observable diffeomorphism invariant, which is, uh, you know, the way you construct Wilson lines in gauge theories, is you can say, define the observable relationally with respect to infinity. For instance, you could say, you know, let, let me draw an ADS picture. You could say, let me start at the boundary at t equal to zero. Let me draw a geodesic uh, for proper distance tau equal to, I don't know, 10 in some units. And then let me ask for phi at the end of that geodesic. This is now a gauge invariant operator because if I make a diffeomorphism, it doesn't change anything, right? The geodesic is some geodesic, it's some diffeomorphism invariant quantity. And I start at the boundary and at the boundary, I'm not allowed to make diffeomorphisms. If I make a diffeomorphism, the boundary, that's a physical change of state. I make some small diffeomorphism that doesn't change where this field is. This field now is rigid against small diffeomorphisms. So if you want to define an operator, a local operator in gravity, you have to define it relationally. If you define it relationally, that's the analog of dressing an operator with a Wilson line. So in gravity, you can't write down the same simple Wilson line operator that you write down in gauge theories, but you can define a notion of dressing. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one way to define a notion of dressing is to say, you know, you start at the boundary or some place where the metric, where you're not allowed to make diffeomorphisms, where diffeomorphisms are physical. And from there, you drop some geodesics, you follow the geodesic for some distance, and then you evaluate the operator at the end of that. Okay. So this is, if you think about local operators in this sense, you will see that in gravity, there is no such thing as a localized gauge invariant operator. Okay. So there do not exist local gauge invariant operators in gravity. This is actually a result that's well known. If you look at the, the literature on quantum gravity, uh, it's a well-known result that there are no such thing as localized gauge invariant operators in quantum gravity. This is yet another way to say what we've been saying so far. You know, if you want to change something inside the black hole, you have to act with some operator that changes the state of the black hole, but this operator cannot be localized to the interior of the black hole uh, because it must have a Wilson line, uh, or when I say Wilson line in gravity, that means that the operator must be defined with relation to some, some geometry far away, which is fixed. And this Wilson line has to run all the way out to infinity because unlike gauge theories, the Wilson line can't just terminate and you can't have just a closed Wilson loop. Uh, that's not, you can't make operators in gravity gauge invariant in that sense. Uh, so there is in fact a well-known result. This result, some of you might have heard. Uh, it's a well-known, uh, and that result is, is this. And, and the result, the intuition for the result is precisely this, the gravitational Wilson lines in gravity have to extend out to infinity. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, the question, can, yeah. Can the operator not be uh, defined relationally to the singularity? Relationally to the singularity. I don't know how to do that. And that's not a good way generally when you define, I mean, well, uh, I, 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 you know, if generally when you speak of quantum gravity, you define it by keeping the asymptotics fixed and allowing something uh, to vary in the interior. So you say that you have some large diffeomorphisms uh, asymptotically, and you know, the singularity in some theory of quantum gravity is just some region where quantum effects become important. Uh, so it's not some, you know, it's not some special region from the point of view of 
uh, how you define the Hilbert space of the theory. So in general, yes. if you did a path integral or you do something else, you'd like to say you keep the asymptotic geometry fixed. There is a meaning to diffeomorphisms there. There are large gauge transformations which are physical, which move the asymptotics. Uh, but you know the singularity is some point in the interior. So it's not that you know diffeomorphisms at the singularity uh, are, are not gauge or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the singularity is just some point where some quantum gravity effects became strong. So you don't hold the singularity fixed when you sum over geometries or when you do quantum gravity, you hold the asymptotics fixed. So you have to rest things with respect to the asymptotics, not with respect to the singularity. I see, thanks. Okay. So this is yet another, I mean, you know, I've, I've just been giving you various arguments. I have not said that this is yet another, in, uh, yet another uh, intuition uh, for why, for the claim that one can't change the interior without changing the exterior. Okay, and I emphasize uh, uh, the nth time that this is not a proof yet, but you know, uh, we, we are finding that, that the, the principle of ignorance is not as innocuous in quantum gravity as it is in quantum field theory or in classical gravity. Okay. Okay. Okay, uh, Subra, there are a couple of questions. Uh, can I actually, yeah, oh, oh, go on. Maybe I can take quick questions, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think a few of them are quick. Uh, yeah. the, the first question is this this gravitational dressing is uh, not unique for a given bulk operator. Yeah, like it's, it's not unique. It's not Absolutely. unique. Right. Yeah. yeah, you can make Wilson lines run in all sorts of ways. And so there's no unique dressing, but there has to be some mm -hmm. dressing. And whatever the dressing is has to run to the boundary in some way. Just like Wilson lines are not unique, you can make the Wilson line run one way or the other way or curve around like, a, you know, in some way. Uh, but it has to, you know, Wilson lines can end, but gravitational Wilson lines have to go off to infinity. Okay. Then the, then the next question is, what do you mean by gravity analog of Wilson line? Uh, yeah, the gravity analog of the Wilson line, one, one, you know, so as I said, one way to think about the gravitational analog of the Wilson line is by dressing operators by means of this relational prescription. But you say, you know, you, you start at infinity, you throw some geodesic, you follow it for some time, and then you measure the operator at the end of that. That would be one way, one analog of defining a gravitational Wilson line. By the way, there's another way to say this, which is mathematically simpler, which is you just fix a gauge. And you could also, you can also just fix a gauge and then speak of operators in that gauge. Uh, but when you fix a gauge, you have to fix a gauge starting at infinity. So you can't fix a gauge locally in some region. When you fix a gauge, you, you know, you have to, you have, that's again, some non-local thing which you do. And so you can speak both in gauge series and in gravity in terms of fixing a gauge. Uh, but once again, it's clear, you know, if you fix a gauge, you can't just, you know, it's not the operator you're talking about, which looks like a local operator in a given gauge is not really local, actually extends out to infinity. And once again, suggests this, that you can't change the interior without changing the exterior. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, there are some more, but you want to take them down? Yeah, maybe I, if, you, if you could wait for five minutes, we can just complete fine, fine. what no I problem. want to say and then we we'll No problem. On. Sure. Okay. okay, good. So let, let me say, say a couple of, uh, couple of things. Uh, so uh, I, I want to say that, uh, yeah, good. Uh, so, you know, uh, so uh, I, I, you know the, the point of all of this was actually just to go back to the first slide and point out that we have now, you know, in some sense found uh, some issues with both uh, Hawking's uh, argument, right? With the fact that there's a concrete computation, which we pointed out was not surprising, didn't lead to a paradox and the intuition which we found was problematic. Uh, so sometimes, you know, people say, you know, have, have we found an, error in Hawking's argument, right? And we have in some sense found an error in Hawking's argument and the Hawking's argument is clearly insufficient. Right? So have we, so is there, have we found an error? And, you know, sometimes people say, you know, we, we've not, you know, we have some argument from ADS CFT, but we don't have an error in Hawking's argument, uh, but we do, right? Uh, we find that, and the error is, is pretty simple the compute, you know, computations of low point correlators are insufficient, are insufficient to conclude that the final state is thermal. And the second error is that intuition about the principle of ignorance is very subtle, right? This intuition about the principle of ignorance, you know, even if it's, if it's, you know, if, if one wanted to, if one wanted to argue that in some sense it holds, uh, you know, maybe all these things we are saying uh, uh, still prevent the outside observer from knowing everything, but the intuition about the principle of ignorance is subtle. And so the, the conclusion is that, and that's the same about the, the first point, right? Uh, the, the computations of low point correlators are insufficient to conclude thermality. 
and just saying, you know, we have this causal structure and therefore we have a principle of ignorance is insufficient uh, to argue uh, that the outside observer doesn't have information. Uh, so both of these are, you know, tell you that the argument that you have information loss uh, has, uh, you know, inadequacies. And there are these two inadequacies, uh, which we have pointed out, uh, both in the concrete computation and in the intuition. Okay. Now, uh, what I'd like to go on to uh, next time uh, is uh, a more uh, interesting or more formidable paradox. Uh, so what we'd like to start uh, from the next lecture is we'd like to move on uh, to paradoxes uh, that were first formulated by, by Mathur uh, and then elaborated by, by Ams. Uh, and uh, I, let me just give you a, a quick preview of uh, how uh, these paradoxes go. So the basic intuition uh, that Mathur had uh, was that, uh, you know, uh, so far the critical part or the key part about Hawking's argument that we've been using uh, was that Hawking's argument uh, made reference to the exterior and tried to argue that, you know, in the exterior, it looks like the final state is thermal. Uh, the point is that if you also try and keep track of what is happening to the interior of the black hole, uh, then uh, Mathur tried to argue that these arguments we are giving about small corrections being sufficient uh, to fix the paradox uh, run into subtleties and run into difficulties. And so the main point is that if one keeps track also of the interior, which we didn't really do right now, right? Uh, all our arguments in the paradox, so if one looks at, at Hawking's paper, uh, the arguments about the fact that the outside observer loses information uh, didn't really keep track of what the interior was doing. And the main point about these paradoxes is that if one keeps track also of the interior, uh, then the small corrections argument that we've been making, you know, I emphasized many times in this lecture that you, know, you can have these exponentially small corrections, uh, the small corrections argument uh, uh, might not be sufficient. Okay. Uh, so this might actually be a good place uh, to stop uh, before we reach this, uh, this paradox about uh, with Mathur and that Mathur and Ams formulated, uh, we'll have to go through some results on quantum information, uh, which we'll try and do tomorrow. Uh, and then at uh, maybe uh, either at the end of tomorrow's lecture uh, or the after tomorrow, uh, we will go to these other paradoxes. Uh, so just to summarize uh, what we uh, what we did uh, today, uh, you know, we've uh, what we've done so far is uh, we've discussed one formulation of the information paradox, which is the original formulation. Uh, but we find uh, that this formulation is not sufficient really to lead to a paradox because one, it appears that there are all these small corrections which could invalidate the arguments that lead to the paradox. And so uh, the next development uh, is the small corrections theorem uh, of Mathur. Uh, which suggests that, uh, you know, uh, maybe the small corrections argument is too quick. And so we'd like to explore that. And uh, we'll need some quantum information background and uh, some discussion of the page curve before we reach that argument. Uh, so tomorrow we'll take a detour into that. Uh, and then we'll come back uh, to other versions of the information paradox. Uh, so, uh, okay, so uh, I see that we're out of time. Uh, this might actually be a good place uh, to stop uh, since there were some questions and we can take more questions. And uh, those who need to leave uh, can leave. Uh, so let me stop the formal lecture here and then we can take have discussion as usual.